Well, I had an uncle who was a great flamenco guitarist in London, and I used to stay with him. I used to go around to his house in London, and my parents would drop me off, and I'd stay there, and he'd let me stay up until midnight, and I'd watch him jamming flamenco with all his mates and stuff, and they played a bit of gypsy jazz too. So right from that date, it, it became obvious that, that was what I wanted to do. So I suppose I was about 10 or 11, and uh, <clears throat> because part of that fa our family is Spanish, so you know flamenco is quite a traditional thing in the family. First met Lee in, I think it was 1976, I came up from Christchurch to do a teaching section at Nine College. He had come out from the UK and had been there a couple of years, and uh, he was in some classes I, I taught, um, but then I really got to know him a bit better the following year when I actually came back as a teacher to the school. I was off a job here. And uh, so of course we caught a bit of contact that year. <laughs> well, I have known him since then and I mean he went into teaching very early. He was teaching while he was at school. So he's had a long sort of apprenticeship and craftsmanship in that area. No, I started, um, the way I started teaching funnily enough was at uh, Nine Eye College, the itinerant guitar teacher left and I was off the job. I was in the sixth form at Nine Eye College and I was off the job. So I was paid to be a teacher whilst I was still at school and I was earning six dollars an hour, man, which is, <laughs> yeah. So, and that, that's how I got started teaching guitar and playing rock and I was in a school band and, you know, that's how I started teaching. So when I was at university, it was my, I think it was my second year at university, I uh, saw a little advert saying they wanted someone to teach guitar at Hutt Valley High School and uh, it was a Saturday afternoon kind of job so it was uh, over at the prefabs over there and uh, so that was 1979 when I started which seems like such a long time ago. And I never, I never went full time at the university. I deliberately stayed part time at the university, so I had time to do these sort of things as well. Because I've always loved this job. In fact, I prefer this more than I do teaching at the university. Yeah. He's been teaching at the high schools for years, so, and um, that's to be admired because it's not easy. People think you know the, the university level. What I do is kind of the higher level teaching, but to me, I think the school teaching is is the most important. That's where people kind of are at that influential teenage years where they things can really happen in their music and in their development and their time and and Lee's kind of ingrained in that whole thing and does a fantastic job of it. So more particularly here at Huppenhoff High School, where he's been a teacher for thirty three plus years, I mean, that's phenomenal for any teacher, let alone an itinerant teacher. Yeah. Um, in one school. What I like about teaching high school kids is that they. They're in touch with the ground floor of music. Like the the only way I'm going to keep keep up with what's going on in music is through these kids. You know, like teaching them songs, and and it keeps me grounded as well with you know how people feel about music out there. So. If it's a student that I've had for a while, I'll probably know quite a lot about their playing. So I sort of have to figure out where they're at first, um, and. My approach is always that the end game is that you're going to perform this piece in front of people or a person or something or other. So you have to, uh, everything I teach is towards the, the end game of actually performing it. You know? So Lee is very direct and he goes quite quickly. And um, I found that quite difficult at first because he's quite demanding. When he was showing me certain things, um, I couldn't think that fast. <laughs> so he's got a very fast um, uh, way of taking music on board and, and, and also in imparting the knowledge. Um, but I think he's got a really good teaching style. He's very practical. He seems to have a sixth sense. He sort of he realizes what a student needs and, and how to get them there quickly. Yeah, well, what I've learned to do over the years is not to push students too hard. Um, I tend to push as hard as they're pushing, but maybe slightly harder. So if I have someone who's really, really keen, then I 
put all my energy into it. Whereas <clears throat> I'm aware that some of my teaching is actually babysitting, you know, for people to hang around music a bit to see if they really figure it out. Want it, you know, if they want to do it, and, and I don't want them to get a bad taste in their mouth about it. I think when I first started teaching, I was pretty heavy on it, you know, like, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. But it doesn't work. So. You know, he has a real um, passion and energy um, with regard to music and with regard to enthusing younger people with, with the gift of music. And it's just his personality. It's, it's one student described it as being a very big personality, which I think is, is true. Um, well, back in the 80s, he played a lot of gigs with lots of musicians, lots of good musicians, uh, visiting artists. So he did a lot of gigs back in the 80s. And then he sort of went more into teaching. He was still doing gigs, but I think he became more of a teacher that played occasionally. And I think that's because he, he really loves teaching. Yeah, I'd say both of us are very keen teachers. We both love to teach. We both love teenagers, young people, well that's my preferred teaching age. Lee also teaches a lot of adults. Um, and we talk a lot about certain issues that come up. I might have an issue that I, I've got a student I can't quite get through to on a certain level and I'll talk about it with Lee or he'll say I've got a student that's something or other and we'll just talk about it as if to solve the problem for that student. So it's kind of professional development. Yeah. Um, on a daily basis because we, we love music really and um, yeah. And that was, uh, I joined the university in 1984 I think it was, around right about then, and I ended up teaching there, running the jazz guitar and the jazz piano department for close to 20 years. I was playing with a couple of guys, as Roger Sellers and Colin Hemmingson and Paul Dine, and a lot of us, we, we were really interested in teaching as well as playing. At that point, we were doing a lot of playing. Um, Colin Hemmingson approached the uh, Polytech at that point, saying, do you want a jazz course? And so eventually he was running like a jazz course, and then Roger Sellers came in and ran a combo course, and then the, it started to look like it was going more towards a diploma and a degree. So I came in and started teaching theory and improvisation. And then we just built more and more staff and the course got bigger and bigger. And then I was part of the team that pushed it through uh, into degree status, which means that, um, you know, it's like a fully fledged bachelor in music. So yeah, it was a very natural thing. We just all sort of fell into it really. Very hard to be a full-time jazz musician in New Zealand, so teaching was sort of saved our asses a bit. Um, okay, so when I was about well, year, year 13, I was a seventh form at Scott, I'd have been about 17, um, I put an application in for the, what was it called, the Wellington Conservatorium of Music, which was an offshoot of the Polytech, and Lee was probably the main guy there, him and... Paul Dyne and Colin Hemmingson were the main lecturers, so I put in an application and just a standard kind of fill out a form, what can you do, um, send it off to Wellington. Um, I think I enclosed a tape back in those, you mean you know what a tape is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the tape with um, some recordings of me playing just by myself and over the top of some chord changes to try and kind of get an idea of, you know, how, how good I was, whether I'd get a chance of getting in. That sort of thing. Anyway, Lee phones me up one day, so that's how I met him. He phoned up and spent probably half an hour, an hour talking to me on the phone from Wellington. Um, I was in Rotorua, and yeah, he first thing he said was that he liked my playing. Um, then he totally deconstructed everything I'd played, and he said, um, "Oh, I can tell that you're really into Mark Knopfler. I can hear a Knopfler influence." And I was like, "Oh, yeah, yeah." And then he said. And I love the way you go to the seventh note of the minor scale and you play a diminished lick there. And he goes, that's kind of like Malmsteen. And I was like, yeah, because I transcribed Malmsteen and Offler. So here's this guy i have never met before just going through. And I like the way you do this and I like the way you do that. But he knew everything. He just, he, he knew my background without having ever met me. And um, that was impressive. I thought, yeah, I've got to meet this guy. I'll come go and study there. And 
so I didn't meet him until the next year when I when I went down to study. But um, yeah, it was, it was pretty impressive. This is pre-internet. You don't get to see people like that in Rotorua, and um, yeah. And he actually, he was there when it was Wellington Polytech, so back in the day, and um, that was kind of the foundation of it. It's a very very different school now. It's at Victoria University. Uh, New Zealand School of Music was established between Victoria University and Massey University as a joint school. Uh, and then it shifted and moved in quite a different direction. Um, uh, yeah, uh, some things for the better, some things for the worse, but very very different from what it was. Um, essentially when Lee was teaching there it was kind of a conservatorium type approach. Whereas now it's definitely a university type approach, you know. And both have their merits and weaknesses, and you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a couple of incarnations there. One, one I was very young, and I did the foundation course um, when it was up, it was the Conservatory of Music. I learned a hell of a lot of stuff from um, our immediate teacher Jeff Hughes, who's another one of Lee's former students, and we got to hear Lee playing a lot. So that was a kind. Of, I was very young, and just it just opened my eyes, and I thought, well, um, he, here are some real kind of concrete music aims or life aims. You know, if you could learn to play like that make a career out of it you'd be really feeling like you've achieved something this is looking at people like Lee who were probably I don't know how old he is maybe he's maybe he's um, 15 20 years older than me I've never worked it out um, um, the second time I went back to study was 10 years later and that's when I had a lot more to do with Lee um, it was yeah it was pretty amazing for about a year um, so I went straight into the second year. I was learning an awful lot of stuff, getting a lot of input from Lee and, and the other tutors. When it came to my third year, that was the year that um, Lee and a number of the senior lecturers had kind of gotten into kind of politics with the new management, and a lot of them left that year. So we had a pretty messy year, and um, we had to kind of express that to the management, saying it's, we were really kind of disappointed. We didn't have the same consistency of teaching. So... Um, and that was even that was quite a long time ago now. That's probably um, thirteen years ago when I was there the last time, and Lee was just finishing then. So yeah, it was a good place. Um, I honestly don't know much about the place now. I, I don't even know the teachers. So I think it was Colin Hemmingson set up the um, Polytech Jazz Course, which began as a very small group of people. I think Jan Rutherford was in the first year. Fabulous blind pianist um, and so that grew in exponentially over the years and Lee became their jazz guitar teacher, their jazz piano teacher, composition, arranging and of course theory which he's um, very good at explaining and um, he sort of ended up teaching the most advanced students. I play a lot of guitar um, I play a lot more than I would gig, you know, I do a lot more practice and playing. Um, yeah, I, I just do a lot, just muck around a lot. Um, but I'm either, I, I think I've got two modes, I'm either mucking around aimlessly or I'm working furiously on a piece trying to get it together. I don't seem to have like a middle ground with it. Yeah, I, I think he's he's thought of everything from every different angle and i think he's got a lot of different answers and he's got a lot of knowledge so that gives him a position of power as a teacher and that um you know everything i could ask he had an answer or possible solutions he had an a b and a c and a d um he was kind of an encouraging teacher um very supportive teacher very hands-on let's play let's let's play something it wasn't sitting around talking for half an hour it was like Let's play something now, and um, hey, I'll show you this new thing I'm working on. Was is another good good one of Lee's sort of studying lessons. Um, very direct, not not confrontational, but just you know tells you exactly what you're doing wrong, um, tells you how to fix it, which is the important thing. Um, and certainly in the one-on-one -on -one lessons was just just awesome. You know, it was a lot of playing, a um, lot of uh, really, really good advice garnered from his years of playing. It was all very pr practical, um, not ever doing something for kind of doing doing its sake. It was always, hey, let's let's find a solution to something. And um, yeah, a total 
guitar geek and um, certainly for, for my thing I found I had a lot of questions that I needed <laughs> answered and he, he was sort of the person that had a, had a lot of the answers or, or ways of thinking and um, he, he didn't really give answers he gave possible solutions for you to go away and work on and um, pretty much he wanted you to do everything yourself I mean there was no magic wand um, so that's probably the best sort of sort of teaching I think realistic based on um, struggles he's had himself I, th I thought he taught from his own strengths and weaknesses as well like if he had weaknesses himself he would say hey this is something I do really poorly and you do it too and this is how I've tried to fix it or um, yeah well here was a problem I had and now I'm good at it I want to show you how to be good at it so I thought I thought it was pretty cool yeah um, I, I always tell him that I steal his ideas and I use them all the time because <laughs> that's how it goes if it was some anybody uh, whether they're a great player or a beginner if they play something that's really good that I think can contribute to my music and my art and what I'm trying to do, then I draw on that, wherever that comes from me, whether it be the top or the bottom or wherever. So Lee being a really good player, of course, I, 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 he's very influential on, on all of us. When you're learning improvising and jazz, like it's quite a threatening thing, you know, it's in your face. And um, the last thing you want is for it to be like an overly serious situation. There's got to be a bit of humour. But what I like to do is to get the humour happening, but then make sure there's an undercurrent of really serious stuff going on. It's sort of the way I think most musicians I've worked with in New Zealand, um, that's how they behave. It's always a good laugh and a good joke in the studio until the red light goes on and then it's deadly serious, you know. And that's... I suppose all the musicians that I've hung out with um, have that attitude. They like to have a good laugh and a joke, but underneath it they're ultra serious about their music and their teaching or whatever, you know. We have a lot of fun. As, as, as I mentioned, he's one of the funniest guys I know, so we just joke around and, and I really like that. To me, playing music is only like, a, the actual playing of the music is only like a small portion of the time. So the, the, it's the hang and the jokes and the, the social aspect of it is more important to me. Is, um, that's the part, and that's one thing I've always enjoyed about doing gigs with Lee, because we just we have a great time, we get along really well and we always have, you know. I mean, we've conflicted on things before, as you would with any friendship or relationship, you know, and, um, but we, um, yeah, we get along really well, so that's what, to me, what I like about doing gigs, and he plays well, but that's kind of only one portion of it. Um, I, I know there was a lot of playing together in, at, at the music school, um, basically Lee trying to, trying to force me into playing with people better than me and getting better that way, you know, advice like that. And so he would put together these groups of people a year ahead of me or tutors or whatever and play piano or guitar with, with me. Um, and he always made me sound amazing, which was um, another th really good hint I picked up from him. If you can accompany someone to the point that they sound great, they're gonna wanna play with you. And to even to learn how to do that was, was pretty important. Usually we get together, or whether we're playing, got gigs on, or what, whatever, and there's always toasted sandwiches at Lee's house, so that's always fun. We get together and we uh, bitch and moan about things, and we uh, tell jokes and just be silly, and, uh, and it's a lot of fun. That's one of my fond memories of Lee is just hanging out, and you know, we go, I go over to his place and we just chill. It's great and talk music, and we often, often we won't even play guitar at all. We'll just hang. We have done, we've played a lot together. Um, it's not easy because Lee is very strong rhythmically and, and rhythm is my weakness. So we're kind of opposites in that respect. And also we play, both play chordal instruments. So um, you don't often see a piano guitar duo, duo for that reason. You kind of cancel each other out a little bit and get in each other's way. Um, occasionally, I'll do some singing with him, but he tends to change the time signature or the key or anything to, to kind of trip me out. So it's kind of like, uh, I don't think Lee's really an accompanist. I think that's something that I am. I think it's he's more of a soloist. Um, but he has played with a lot of international players and um, really good players. 
and he's done a lot of traveling in Australia, um, particularly with the Gypsy Jazz, playing festivals over there and um, doing workshops. He does a lot of Gypsy Jazz workshops, teaching that particular style of guitar as well. Um, and, and over the time I've known Lee, his music has changed a lot. He went from playing essentially straight ahead jazz, bebop orientated music to now he does a lot more gypsy jazz and that's primarily been his focus for various different reasons. Um, well I didn't know, certainly the gypsy jazz, I didn't know until five, ten years ago when it sort of became apparent. <clears throat> he became very influential in you know, teaching it around the place, running courses and playing the course and going to Europe, <clears throat> meeting up with some of the gypsy jazz people and living and working with them. Um, oh gosh, it must be 15 years ago or so. Um, he just decided that it was something he wanted to do was to set up these workshops twice a year in Wellington. Um, so he wrote a little book that went with the course and um, he'd get 15, 20 people along. All guitarists, occasionally there'd be a violinist or a bass player. And um, from there he met Sam Cook, who he now plays with regularly. Um, and he's done these workshops, uh, I was trying to think where else, I think in Australia. Um, but anyway, they, they were very popular for a while. I think he's, he's gone off the boil with that particular project at the moment. I've always loved acoustic guitar, and I've always felt that there's not enough acoustic stuff in jazz. Um, and I started listening, when I was a lot younger, I started listening to Django Reinhardt, and always loved the fact that you know, he was like the first guy on the scene to, to, to do jazz properly and became a, he was probably the greatest jazz guitarist to ever live. Um, and there's something in the technique that he's using that makes it look effortless. Like you can play things that are really, really difficult that other people will struggle with. If you use what they call the gypsy restroke technique, um, it's effortless. One of the things I did was I went over to Europe uh, in 2011 and I spent three months over there studying this um, with all the top uh, gypsy jazz players that I could find and I even ended up staying in a few gypsy camps you know learning from these guys uh, so I made some really good contacts in fact one of these guys uh, Lolo Meyer who's one of the greatest gypsy jazz teachers in Europe um, <clears throat> he was in Australia a few years back and he asked me to be his curtain raiser so I got to play uh, over in the um, Brisbane Jazz Club um, as his curtain raiser. So I launched my gypsy jazz career on the internet actually. Yeah, got almost a million hits on one of my clips, which is weird. Really, uh, gypsy jazz hasn't hadn't taken off in New Zealand. Um, so I thought, well, what can I do about that? So I started running these workshops. I did 11 national workshops. Um, which ended up really helping the scene and there's lots of people out there playing it now. I just really wanted to get it started and get people talking about it. But of course now there's, there's a ton of people playing it so I'm pleased about that. That, that only took about eight or nine years to pull off, you know, getting all these people interested. But now I don't really have to do anything because they're all out there playing and, you know. Yeah, I went to one of the Gypsy Jazz workshops, um, I can't remember when it was, maybe four or five years ago, and um, I went for some professional development because it's um, at the time I was doing nearly exclusively bass gigs and it's good to go along and get your ass kicked and meet a whole lot of people that are learning some new skills and um, yeah, I remember going along and had a gig till two that, that morning and with the first day I was really tired and there were two tutors and Lee was one of them and when they divided the class into groups, everyone went with Lee and the other guy was kind of left by himself and me being me, I went with the other guy because <laughs> I'm a nice guy and, it was, and I was very tired. So I sat in with the other, the other tutor for, for the first day and that was really nice. And then the second day I had a bit, a bit of sleep and I went in with Lee's group along with everyone else and he promptly started picking on me to be his accompanist and everything for the demos and um, yeah I got my ass kicked pretty well that day um, 
my lasting memory was of him telling me, just play some time, just play time, whether I wasn't supporting him adequately enough. So it's, it's good to know that you can still kind of go back and um, realise it's just the ABCs of music. You know, play in time, play supportively, um, pulse, rhythm, energy, that sort of thing. So yeah. Yeah, um, a lot of my favourite guitar players have... Um, done the three-year jazz school course over the years um i mean i could probably go through and name 10 20 30 of the the guitar players that i i know would have been taught by lee that that i love but it's not just the guitar players it's actually the fact that lee was teaching the comp the the um sorry the improvisation class there which is all instrumentalist so you're talking about every sax player every pianist that's done that course has had lee for probably a whole year teaching them theory and improvisation so that's you know and if he was there for 13 14 15 years or more that's a hell of a lot of musicians that he's taught um the the skills and the and the, the knowledge of jazz but certainly the guitar players um yeah i mean like i've said, said before just to have someone in front of you that's done all that hard work the transcribing, the the, go, the saving money to go overseas to get lessons, the coming back and telling you exactly what these guys have told him, um, all the problems he's had, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I come across a lot of the the the, the ex students who are um, have all got, gone off on their own directions and are inspiring in their own ways now. A lot of them gave me advice and said, "Hey, put fifty bucks together and go and see Lee." You know, they said you could do worse than doing that. Um, and you know I can give you a list of some of those names if you want. I don't know what they're all doing now, but um, they're they're pretty amazing musicians. Yeah, I, I think I mean essentially improvisation is a universal thing that's been going on since the dawn of time. You know, no one sat down with a piece of paper and learned a piece of music off it. You know, uh, three thousand years ago. So. Uh, our music came out of improvisation. A composition, if you like, is essentially a frozen improvisation. Um, so I think that anybody who's involved in improvisation is going to understand that universal nature of music a bit more. You know, um, most of what we hear in pop and jazz has been improvised. And believe it or not, most of what we hear in classical music has been improvised originally, but when it was composed. So Bach would sit down with a chord sequence and compose melodies around that, you know. Um, in a group, we did a lot of combo classes together where he was the teacher. He, he, would, he would be very, very hard on rhythm sections. The idea being if the rhythm section isn't good, you haven't got a good band. Um, and yeah, focused on the main things, time, time and tone. Um, ideas yeah just just a really good all-round kind of practical teacher um, how do I work on a piece um, well one thing that I don't do is start from the beginning um, and go to the end I was taught to find the hardest part of the music first uh, you know, a guitar piece and get that up and running before everything else because that bit is going to take longer than everything else um, so the biggest mistake I used to make was to keep going back to the beginning. So by the time I had practiced the piece, I would have played bar one a thousand times. And I would have only got to the last bar maybe three or four times. So what an audience is going to hear is a gradual deterioration of my playing over that period of time. So I had a great lesson with a, a musician a long time ago who said, you've, you've got to even it all out. The hardest bar has to be the one that you, you've spent the most time on. Yeah. You need to um, delve into his teaching because he is a very good teacher. He's taught a lot of people and he's got his quirky ways but he's a good thinker about psychology and technique of teaching. Uh, a subtle blend of psychology and extreme violence. No, I don't know. Um, one thing I would say about my teaching is that there isn't a pattern. There isn't a book or a pattern that I use. I'm really keen on dealing with the person in the present moment because I believe that a lot of teachers use books to fart people off. Um, 
what I like to do is to find out more about that student uh, and then encourage them. But I, I suppose I've been told that I'm pretty tough. And I would say that I'd rather be, I'd rather do my job and be thought of as a bit tough than some teachers who are just too busy trying to be friends with their students. I've always believed I want to be friends with my students, but uh, the thing that I want the most is for them to improve. Yeah. So that's my approach is, is uh, pre pretty much um, just trying to dig into each person and figure out what what's the best approach for them at that time. Because everybody's so different. Yeah. I mean, Lee's always had... He's very good, but he's... He knows... He, he always wants to get better. And he always wants to try different things. And he knows he doesn't know everything. But um, he was a very good guitarist, and he could play whatever was required at the time. <laughs> So maybe that's why he needed more, you know, uh, challenges subsequently. In terms of, I mean, he's a really knowledgeable guy and uh, uh, and and one of the funniest people I know, and so I, I steal his jokes all the time. But he's been a big influence on me as far as um, composition and as far as playing the music because it's been his life and it was his life before it became my life. Well. I guess if I hadn't met him, I don't think I would have um, become a jazz pianist because I sort of needed that impact, that, that input that he was able to teach me a lot about. See, we're very, very interested in harmony, both of us, so he was able to sort of describe or play certain things to me. Um, and um, there was really no one else around that I think could have could have done that at the time. I think he's had a huge influence here and um, that's not to be underestimated. Like I said, uh, I think the school level is, is the most important. That's when people are most influential and when the longest term gains can happen. For example, technical stuff, that's the age to get the technique together on certain things, right? You can't do it later in life, you've got to do it then. If you really want to get to any kind of level with the technique, you do it when you're young and then it stays with you. Right, and so Lee's really good at getting that happening with young players, and I think it's a really important, crucial time. It's almost too late if they come to uni come to audition for university and they haven't got fundamental things going on. And Lee's really good at that. So I don't, yeah, I think he's one of the most influential teachers around. That's great. Um, you know, Lee Lee'd be the the best guitarist or the most you know most knowledgeable guitarist. So he's just all pervasive really. I sort of see the, the gigs that he's done or the, the teaching that he's doing or the knowledge that he has and the fact that he'd be the preeminent guitarist in New Zealand jazz history without a doubt. You know, I mean, you could ask 20 or 30 or 40 guitarists around who's the guy that knows all their stuff and more. It would be Lee. And um, the fact that he's not widely recorded that I know about anyway is is, is amazing. Um, maybe that's changing now with with the advent of YouTube and things like that and maybe some old stuff will be re released and um, from talking to Lee recently he probably feels he's only starting to make um, important statements now. You know he's spent, spent his whole life learning to play the music and has a family, he's become a human being and now he's got some musical things to say, to say. so maybe the maybe all the recordings are going to start coming and um, then it will be documented for people to think wow so where does he fit uh, to me he's the the preeminent guitarist in in New Zealand jazz history he has to be you know um, there are great guitarists around and and probably 90 percent of them have been taught by Lee um, whether or not they sound anything like him um, yeah you know for me you think jazz guitar over the last 30 years and you think Lee. Uh, well one of my guitar teachers when I was young at probably your age at school was one of Lee's students so I suppose I probably indirectly got information from Lee. Um, but you know he's, he's a good old friend in a way now because we've known each other so long and uh, at Hartley High School you know I see him once a week at least um, when you're, you know throughout the school year.
when, when you look at someone like that who's sort of definitely a role model, um, I, I sort of see it, I, I like the fact he's a normal guy wearing normal clothes, never gave us a stuff about being hip, didn't want to fit in with a cool crowd or whatever, just wanted a relationship with music, played the hell out of music, um, was down to earth, um, humble to the point of almost self deprecating. Um, in fact, he even said to me something about he, he felt like he'd had a non-career. And I just laugh and think of a lot of the people that are out there that are really good salespeople or promo people having a career. I mean, you know, who's New Zealand's most famous jazz musician? I don't know. A lot of people would say Nathan Haynes, and he looks good on the CD covers and wears flash clothes. But, um, you know, like, so I always liked the idea of this earthy guy that would learn basically everything you could learn about music, um, play as well as you can without any ears and graces. One of the worst ones, I don't know if I can say it on camera, but I had a brand new Honda City, and uh, when I used to come into Taita College, uh, I used to do a bit of a skit on the grass. But, uh, and they all, the kids all used to wait for me to come in, you know, they used to knew that I was going to be there at about 10 o'clock, so they'd wait for me to come in and do a big skit across the grass. And anyway, one day I lost it and smashed or ploughed straight uh, my car straight into the prefab, the music prefab, and broke the wall and the downpipe and all that sort of stuff. So uh, the kids haven't stopped talking about it since, apparently. Uh, I don't know how I managed to get away with it, you know. Gary was the head of music at that point, so maybe he went into that. But I was just a stupid thing, you know, showing off in front of kids.